Welcome everyone to Monday Match Analysis. I'm Gil Gross. Yannick Sinner is still yet to lose in 2024. Facundo Diaz Acosta is a champion on the ATP Tour and Carlos Alcaraz is still without a title since Wimbledon. I am also going to talk about the one-handed backhand stuff on this week's Monday Match Analysis. Lots of good stuff on the show. Just a couple of reminders before I get into it. Have you subscribed to The Draw? It is my new newsletter where I curate all of the best tennis content on the internet every week. Go to thedraw.tennis to subscribe. I'm on T2 this week as well. Uh, I think some of you appreciate when I announce that. Uh, 9 a.m. Eastern Time, I believe, is when I will be on the air Monday through Thursday this week on T2. Let's talk about one-handed backhands. I already talked about one-handed backhands on last week's Coach's Mailbag with Jonathan Stokey. And we got into the technical side of it. And we talked about some good stuff, but this is going to be completely different. Because what everybody is asking right now, now that Stefanos Tsitsipas has exited the ATP top 10 and there are no one-handed backhands in the top 10 for the first time ever, the question that everybody wants to know the answer to is, is this permanent? Is this something that is just a blip in history? Or is it a real trend that's going to signal the direction that we will be going into the indefinite future. And I think if you asked me that a few years ago, not I think, I know, that I would have said, look, is it trending down? Are there less and less one-handers? Yeah, of course. But first of all, there are some advantages to the one-handed backhand. Second, maybe more importantly, there are always going to be some players where it just comes more naturally to them. That's what I would have said a few years ago. And that logic still makes sense in my brain. Still makes a lot of sense. But at a certain point, it doesn't really matter what is logical to me. And you have to start looking at what's actually happening in the real world. So let's do that today. If you look at just the top 10 thing by itself, it really doesn't tell you much. Stefanos Tsitsipas can still be a top 10 player. He's... As we speak on the very border of the top 10, Grigor Dimitrov is right there as well. Dominic Team was playing top 10 tennis not very long ago. Denis Shapovalov briefly was in the top 10. He's still young enough to make some sort of a comeback into that range. So you can look at the top 10 thing alone, and there's a lot of reason to be like, all right, this is just a moment, whatever. It will correct itself. Here's why all of that is ignoring reality. It's ignoring reality because the only way something continues on tour is if young players are doing it. If there are prospects. If you can see what the future looks like. I want to read all of the top one-handers in, in order. I want to just give you the rankings. So obviously, uh, number 10, Tsitsipas, 13, Dimitrov. Uh, th this is this week, so next week this might look a little bit different. But you have Tsitsipas, Dimitrov, 26, Lorenzo Musetti, 34, Chris Eubanks, 44, Dan Evans, 53, Daniel Altmaier, 58, Dusan Lajevic, 60, Stan Wawrinka, 67, Christopher O'Connell, 90, Dominic Team, 102, Alexander Kovacevic, uh, 127, Shapovalov, 130, Gazke, 152, Andrea Vavasori, 164, Giovanni Pecci Pericard, uh, 198, Marco Cecchinato. Now we're outside of the top 200, 202, Federico Gallo, 209, Oriol Roca Batea, 218, Matteo Martino. Where's the youth? Where are the prospects? There's one guy in that group under the age of 25, who's never been in the top 10, who I think will clearly have a chance, and he's not a sure thing by any means, but will clearly have a chance to be a top 10 player at some point, and that's Lorenzo Musetti. And then after that, you're kind of lost. Now, the young Frenchman, uh, Giovanni Mpeci Pericard, sorry if I didn't pronounce it right, uh, he's in a nice spot at 20 years old. 
164 in the world. Haven't seen him play. I don't know if he has a chance to be a top 10 player down the road, but the point is there's not enough of him in that list. I tweeted about this. I got a reply from someone named Marco. He said, uh, I checked the currently the best, uh, the top 30 highest ranked teenagers and nobody in that top 30 has a one-hander. Another one from Anthony's Tennis Hub. Anthony said, I just looked through all the one-handed backhand among ATP pros. There are only four players younger than 25 with a one-handed backhand on the entire tour. It's Musetti, Shapovalov, Toby Kodot, who is world number 319, uh, a guy named Lillian Marmu, uh, Marmuzes, he's 860 in the world. So you look at the youth, and there's no one-handers. That, that is the evidence that one-handed backhands are going away. Not that there are none in the top 10 next week. My inclination on this one-handed backhand question has always been to calm fears. Again, my logical brain has always told me, eh, one-handers, they'll be a rarity, but they will always have a place on tour. And that was just me giving my opinion, what I think. But at a certain point, I can't ignore what we're seeing. The facts are right there in front of us. The facts tell us, at least right now, that this whole no one-handers in the top 10 thing, this isn't just a moment. This isn't just a blip. This is the first sign, the first domino to fall in what is going to be, and what already is, a real trend. A trend that shows no sign of reversing itself. Let's talk Sinner. Sinner beats Demonor in Rotterdam. They've now played seven times now. Sinner has only lost one set. But this was a really close match and a really good match. And I think the biggest reason for that is I don't think Demonor can play any better. I thought Alex played as well as Alex can play. He served... As well as he can. The forehand down the line was firing in a big way. Making those redirections beautifully. He was the more solid player. We know that in order for Demonor to win in this head-to-head. -head, as the player with a little bit less firepower. He needs to be more consistent. And he was. Sinner was a little bit leaky on the forehand. And I think Demon kept his errors. A little bit more under control. Than Yannick. Total points won in the match was only a three-point difference. So this was tight. Margins were small. And knowing that, it makes it even more significant that I felt Demon Orr kept losing points the same way over and over and over again. There was one thing I kept seeing. I couldn't believe how often I was seeing it. It was Demonor getting himself into a great position, having a ball to attack, usually on the forehand, hitting approach shots into the ad corner, and Sinner comes up with a great backhand pass and wins the point. I kept seeing it again and again and again. And at the end of the day, a, a lot of them were hats off to Sinner, you know, golf clap to Sinner, too good, great shot. And that can be true. And that certainly was true. At the same time, Demon got way too predictable. He was hitting every approach shot into the ad corner without fail. And you could see Sinner reading it. You could see him getting an early jump on it. I don't think the reason why Demon Orr was always going into Sinner's backhand, always approaching into Sinner's backhand, I don't think that was a game plan thing. I don't think that that's something that Adolfo Gutierrez would have advised him to do before the match. I actually think that's Demon Orr's natural bias. 
and it's it's pretty common for somebody who hits a flat forehand to have a bias when it comes to attacking into the ad court. Roberto Bautista Agut is the same way. Daniil Medvedev is the same way. There's a slight bias into the ad court. Anybody who doesn't who doesn't have that natural low to high usually doesn't like to come around the outside of the ball and you know hit cross court quite as much. All of them can obviously do it. But the players who hit really flat on the forehand usually prefer to kind of swipe across and almost catch the left side of the ball when they're flattening it out. And when they go inside out or down the line, not only are they hitting it flat, but sometimes they can get a little bit of side spin and the ball can actually tail away from their opponent. Demon Orr can certainly do that, as can RBA and Medvedev. So I, I do think it's the more natural corner to hit into for Demon Orr's forehand. But you got to mix it up. You just have to. Especially against Sinner, who is so skilled when he gets to that, when he gets there with the open stance backhand. There was like one of them, I think he got to close his stance, but the vast majority of these were, were open stance backhands. And he hits it so incredibly well, especially if you're a Demonor and your pace isn't huge. If your pace isn't huge, it makes it even more important that you're not getting predictable when it comes to your locations. So um, I hit up Tennis Insights, and they confirmed a lot of what I was seeing here. So Demon Orr conversion score, which is what percentage of points is he winning when in attack, was 60% for this match. It was 73% in Rotterdam for the week coming into the final. So huge dip there. Demon came in 22 times. He only won 55% of the points. In his uh, in last year, so over the course of the 2023 season, Demon Orr won 68% of his net points. You've heard this, you've heard me say this before, but for anybody who thinks that anything over 50% is good when it comes to net points won, it is I completely disagree with that. That's not good. Uh, that is a slice of points where you happen to be in an offensive position. You are in uh, a great position to win a high percentage of points if you are finding yourself with an opportunity to come forward. So you should not be just slightly above 50%. You should be uh, more like 68%, which is what Demonor did over the course of the large sample size of last year. Can zoom in on a couple moments here. First set five all. Demonor lost four points in attack. One of them was a forehand on forced error. The other three were point-winning backhand passing shots by Sinner. That was a break of serve in the first set. It would be 6-5. Sinner would serve it out, win the first set 7-5. Second set, three all. Two backhand passing shots from Sinner to get to 15-30 in that game. He'd end up breaking decisively. And he'd hold the rest of the way to win the second set, 6-4. So, it was, uh, it was uncanny how often we saw Sinner take away points from the, the, the grasp of Demon Orr with backhand passing shots. And my critique for Alex is, is really that you just have to be more unpredictable in that spot. All right. Power also, huge deal for me. You know, I think the power in this matchup matters. Uh, the Demon Orr backhand, it just offers up a little bit too much time too often. And also Sinner has these big moments where he finishes points from improbable positions. I'm not going to pull them up right now or talk about them right now, but you better believe that there are some crucial spots in this match where they are in, in neutral baseline rallies and Yannick comes up with something special off the ground from behind the baseline in a position where you know, Alex could only really dream of generating point-ending damage from these positions. And every once in a while, Sinner is going to be able to do that. Uh, point will look completely neutral, and Sinner will just break it wide open with some something spectacular off the ground. And that also, I think, makes a difference on those fine margins. So Sinner now since the U.S. Open. 32-2 and two record. 
four titles and seven events. If you're thinking that math doesn't add up, remember there was a withdrawal, which doesn't count as a loss on Yannick's record. So it's four titles in his last seven events, but one of the three events that he didn't win was a withdrawal. He's up to number three in the world now. And uh, we got a real streak on our hands. Still undefeated this year. How long can he go without losing? Let me say this now. On Sinner's win streak, Indian Wells is drastically different conditions than anything that Sinner has played since the U.S. Open. It's drastically different. The air is different. The speed is different. The height of bounce is different. It's just a very different thing. That's a big test. But Miami? Miami is Yannick Sinner's best tournament. Always has been. You can go back to the very start of his career. Miami's his best tournament. So if Yannick wins Indian Wells... We might have a very special winning streak on our hands to begin this 2024 season. It already is a pretty special win streak, but if he wins Indian Wells, all I'm saying is it's on. Buenos Aires, another first-time winner on the tour, another wild-card champion on the Golden uh, Swing. We talked about Luciano Darderi last week. Diaz Acosta, Facunda, Facundo Diaz Acosta. Uh, four challenger titles last year. So I think it, it's this is, I'd say, slightly less surprising than Darderi, but on a similar vein, I could have counted the number of tour level victories that Diaz Acosta had in his career on one hand. It would have been four. Could have counted it on one hand coming into the week. As I mentioned, though, four challenger titles last year. Great performance against Fritz at the Australian Open this year that got my attention. So, for me, this is less out of nowhere than the Darderi title in Cordoba last week. Uh, Diaz Acosta, he was 87. Uh, he'll move up to 59. I'm not going to do anything super deep when it comes to the analysis. I really mostly just ran out of time here. But I will say... That lefty forehand is very, very reliable. He moves it around the court extremely well. Finding good width on that forehand comes very naturally to him. And I think it's a brilliant controlling shot on the red clay. The main thing I'm going to cover when it comes to Buenos Aires is the semifinal which was Nicholas Jari over Carlos Alcaraz. Jari unable to convert this big win, which was the best of his career, with the title. Uh, but I want to talk about this match in some detail. First of all, Jari has always played Alcaraz tough. They played in Rio last year. Jari won the first set. It was 4-all in the second. It was 5-all in the second. So there were, there were some tight moments there where Nico was on the precipice of potentially beating Carlos Alcaraz. And this was an Alcaraz who is in the midst of playing really, really good tennis. Wimbledon, they played last year. It was 7-5 in the fourth. That was an uncomfortable match. Very, very uncomfortable match for Alcaraz. And I think the reason why Jari has always presented some issues is, among other reasons, I think the main reason is that Nico is one of the most aggressive returners on tour. You have to serve him tough or you're going to be defending right away. That's the mindset for Jari, is if he, has a, if he has a look at a return, he's going to have offensive intentions on that return to serve, regardless of if it's a first serve or a second serve that he's looking at, which is pretty unique on tour. But for Jari, it's a very appropriate mindset to have because he is not a very good mover. He is not somebody who's going to win a lot of points on defense. So he is absolutely correct to try to take control right away with his return of serve. It is just like when you're, you know, playing Yelena Ostapenko on on the women's tour. Um you have to serve her tough because if you don't, she's going to hit return winners. She's going to hit return forced errors. She's going to find winners off of uh the fourth shot of the rally. You have to serve tough. And 
that's what happened to Alcaraz in this match is his serve got punished way too often. First set tiebreak. He started with a double fault and then Jari hit a backhand return for a forced error off of the second serve. So too many breaks on the first two service points in the tiebreak for Alcaraz and Carlitos didn't even have a chance. He didn't get a, a, return, a shot in play after the serve. Second set one all was the same thing, except for an entire game. Second set one all, all Jari did in the points that he won was hit a return. That's it. I'll go through it. 15 love. Alcaraz missed a neutral first ball backhand. Unforced error long. 15 all. It's a short return. It's an attackable one, but it's a backhand for Alcaraz. He goes to the drop shot, and he misses it wide. So two backhand unforced errors to start for Alcaraz. 30 all. Alcaraz hits a poor wide serve. Forehand return. It's a first serve, but the forehand return hammered cross court by Jari. Rushing Alcaraz's forehand into an error. Deuce. Second serve. Backhand return. Inside in from Jari. Alcaraz has time, but he's pushed into the corner and he tries to defend high uh, cross court and it goes long. So that's a forced error on the return from Jari. At out, break point. Body served by Alcaraz. Another first serve. Really good backhand return. Deep middle by Jari. Rushed the Alcaraz forehand into another miss hit. Error. Folks. That's six points. That is six points. And all Jari did was hit returns. That's insanity. If And it's a combination, obviously, of Alcaraz with some poor backhand mistakes early in the game. But then after that, he got his, he got his serve destroyed three times. And only one of them was a second serve. And he got his serve destroyed three times. That was early in the second set. Um, and I, I might have said it was one all. That's wrong. It was actually one love. Alcaraz, I believe, up the break at that point. And this was Jari breaking right back. 3-4 uh, game. 3-4 game Alcaraz serving. They played six points. And Jari made six strong returns. He ended up breaking at 30. Not a single return in that game was not quality. Not a single ball did Alcaraz really have a high percentage attack. There was one where he hit a first ball drop shot, but the return came in with a lot of speed, and it was a difficult drop shot that Alcaraz was able to make. There were two points that Jari won straight outright off the return. One was on an Alcaraz serve and volley. Jari came up with the pass. And then one was on break point. Another big return, deep middle-ish, wins the point outright. You just can't lose, if you're Alcaraz, you just can't lose this many points uh, off of, on the, basically on the third shot of the rally. Serve, return, Alcaraz loses. That's it. Now, I will say, uh, Jari on serve, he did a great job against Alcaraz's deep return position. When Nico went to the serve and volley, it was excellent. Jari's drop shots were really, really good in this match. There were a lot of short returns from Alcaraz, and Jari did pretty well with his forehand in those situations. Um, and Jari was also still getting a lot of free points, even with Alcaraz standing all the way at the back fence. I will say that for most of the match, Nico was getting outmaneuvered in the rallies. That is to be expected. 100% that is to be expected. But in the last three games of the match, so from three all in the second set, you got to give Jari a ton of credit for really stepping up a few times and coming up with spectacular play in rally situations. His consistency went up from where it was for the, for the, the match before that point. Uh, there were some... Great displays of touch on drop shot exchanges. And at 5-4, Alcaraz really dug in. 
Uh, he made a lot of returns, some good returns at 5-4 did Alcaraz. Uh, but the first serve of Jari was really incredibly on point. If you look at the down the stretch of that 5-4 game, even though Alcaraz almost broke, Jari was hitting great spot serves every single time. Um, and Alcaraz was doing well to make returns, but it was an aggressive plus one to start the point for Jari, which was crucial. I don't really think it should have gotten to that point. Again, as, as much as I think Jari was pretty spectacular from three all in the second set, I think if Alcaraz played at the level that he really should, uh, it, he wouldn't have been down a set in three all. In the first set, there were chances for Alcaraz, and he was actually holding quite easily for most of the first set. He missed a second serve return at 15-30, love one. Alcaraz. And he also missed another second serve return at love 34-5. These were not big, powerful second serves. These were regular second serves. You cannot miss those returns in those spots. Not against, especially against a great server in Jari. You get a look at a second serve and you have a chance. And this is in a first set where Alcaraz is the better player in rally. He's not even trying to be all that aggressive on these returns. You miss two crucial second serves. That's why you end up in a tie break instead of finding a break at some point. And then, you know, there was an opportunity in throughout the first set. I think there was an opportunity for Alcaraz to return better, to defend better when Jari really was pretty erratic. And Carlitos just couldn't drag him into enough rallies for that to really matter. And then once Jari started playing well, it was going to be crucial that Alcaraz served a lot better than he did, which I covered already. Overall, I would not give Alcaraz high marks for his level. Uh, I And again, it's not taking anything away from Jari. played a pretty good match, but Jari's a top 20 player, and he's a tough matchup for Alcaraz. I don't think Jari did anything absolutely out of this world to win this match. I thought Jari was just Jari. Like Jari's a top 20 player with big weapons, so he just did his thing. I don't think he played crazy. Uh, but but Alcaraz, he can do better in many areas. Now, you have a situation in this case where first match on clay, first match since the Australian Open. I think next week, Rio, you definitely start to run out of excuses. I do think it's somewhat important that Alcaraz wins Rio. It, it feels a little bit weird for me to say that because it's just any other ATP 500. I just think you don't play clay in February as the world number two to make deep runs. Like that's not, that's not why Alcaraz goes to South America and plays the Golden Swing. If you're Alcaraz, you play the Golden Swing to collect a title, period. And I think it would go a long way heading into the Sunshine Double. And it's a field where, in theory, Alcaraz doesn't need to be a, an absolute superstar uh, in order to win it. He, he just needs to play uh, a pretty good level for him, and he should be able to get through. Won't be the case at Indian Wells, where he'll, he's defending a title. So I just feel like it's a pretty big swing here because if he wins Rio, now the title drought is over. You're going to a place at Indian Wells where you played some of your best tennis ever. You like those conditions. Now it's you're, you're feeling pretty good heading into that week. He doesn't win Rio. You just have this, this weight on your shoulders trying to defend this title where... You can't really say that you've had a great week in a really, really long time if you're Alcaraz. And uh, clearly, clearly that has an effect mentally. So feels like a big Rio de Janeiro for Carlos Alcaraz. Uh, congratulations, congratulations to uh, Facundo Diaz Acosta. This was a great story. Great crowd in Buenos Aires, as always. Shout out to the Argentines. That is all I got for this week. Hope you enjoy. Don't forget to subscribe. I'll see you next time.